Well, we're thankful to be able to think about Jesus again today. Say it with me, Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Remember Hebrews 3 and verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We've been talking about times when Jesus, the one who said yes to so many and healing and certainly said yes to uh, the mission to save mankind from sin, Uh, we've been talking about some instances where he said no. And today I want to uh, kind of finish up that particular series of thoughts uh, with uh, the idea that Jesus said no to just giving people gimmicks. Um, we're going to uh, go back and, uh, and look at uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verses 38 through 42 to begin with. Um, <clears throat> we're going to look at just a few different passages today, but I want to spend the bulk of our time in John chapter 6 because I think that is where uh, this uh, point that we're making is really pointed out. But gimmicks, I mean, mankind seems to have... Uh, sort of an obsession with gimmicks. Um, we, we have a family friend that uh, every time he would be around some children, uh, he would show them how he, he could take his thumb and uh, make his thumb come apart, you know, and uh, by holding his hand a particular way, it looked like his thumb was coming in too. And the kids would say, do it again, do it again. But the thing is, adults are... Uh, fascinated with gimmicks. Uh, you, you remember there was a, a, a show on TV for a while called The Masked Magician. And this basically was, was a bunch of us gr- kids grown up calling ourselves adults saying to the magician, do it again and show us how you did it. Uh, we're just fascinated with those things. But uh, over in Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 38... Uh, beginning. I want you to notice there, uh, it says, Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so he says, I'm, I'm not going to give you a sign. I, I'm saying no to that request. And, of course, we began this whole, uh, this whole series uh, in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus uh, refused to give a sign there. Uh, I also want you to notice um, over in Luke chapter 11 and beginning in verse 14, Uh, how Jesus also said no to this idea of gimmicks there. Luke uh, 11 and verse 14, it says, He was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. Now, they were testing him. They wanted to see a sign, though though Jesus did many things that should have been convincing enough, uh, yet they were wanting to see more. So uh, Jesus used his signs and wonders judiciously. He used them at his uh, discrimination, and uh, he decided when he was going to do that. And it was for a purpose, you know, according to 
uh, John chapter 20. Uh, These things were done uh, so that you might believe, Jesus said. And, uh, you know, this idea of being dazzled by these signs, it's uh, not something uh, that is new. In fact, uh, my wife and I, we uh, use this passage quite often talking about the things that are going on in our nation right now, for one thing. But the preacher in Ecclesiastes 1 and in verse 9 said, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. When you think about, you know, some incredible event that happens uh, or some uh, remarkable way that people behave, chances are uh, it was done long ago. Same types of things. And, and this idea of wanting to be dazzled with gimmicks, uh, it, it's nothing new. It was going on. In Jesus' day. In fact, let's go over there and uh, take a look at that now. Uh, we're going to go to John chapter 6. And there is so much in this. I, I, if I spent the time I needed to, uh, we'd, we, we would have a long devotion today. But I want to try to just kind of give an overview. Uh, in John chapter 6, it says, uh, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Now, that is, uh, that, that's a good reason to follow Jesus, because you see the signs, and you, you understand there's power there, and that's what those signs were designed to do, to create faith. But Jesus decided when those signs would be done, what the signs would be. That was not for man to pressure Jesus into or to determine himself what the sign would be. That was up to Jesus. And so uh, in verses uh, 5 through 13 of John 6 is where uh, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And so, uh, you know, uh, this was an incredible thing, and it was meant to be a sign to create faith, but uh, that is not exactly what happened. <clears throat> so um, after Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, if you look at the, the tail end of that, it says in verse 13, therefore they gathered them, that is the fragments up, and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten them. 5,000 people ate, and they gathered up 12 baskets of leftovers. That's a miracle. That's a sign. And it says in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And that is the way that the signs were supposed to work, to create faith. But apparently, uh, either that faith was a shallow faith or it was short-lived because uh, Jesus changes locations and those people go uh, to and follow him. And as they follow him, uh, in verses 35 through 65 of John chapter 6, I'd encourage you to get into that and really study that uh, in depth. But in those verses, one of the things that Jesus teaches them, you know, he had given them bread. He had made that bread uh, fill that those five little barley loaves of bread. He'd made that fill 5,000 stomachs and have leftovers. And so he uses that, uh, that analogy, and he says, uh, I am the bread from heaven. And he tells them, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you don't have any part with me. And, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people use this passage uh, before eating the Lord's Supper, and I suppose that's okay. Uh, But I don't think that is the main thrust of what Jesus is talking about here. When he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not talking just about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper had not been established yet. But what he's talking about is you have to take me and my teaching into you just like you eat food and it goes into you. And food, I mean, if you had a whole banquet table full of food, it would do you absolutely no good, zero. 
unless you take it and eat it, right? And, and so there they have Jesus with all these signs and all these wonders and all this great teaching, but it will do them no good unless they take it into them. That's the eating of his flesh and blood. It's much more than just the Lord's Supper. Uh, one of the reasons I know that is in, this, in John 6, Jesus says that you know those who eat his flesh and drink his blood, they're going to have a part with him. They're going to be saved. You can't do that just by eating the Lord's Supper. Uh, you have to take Jesus into you uh, the way you eat and drink. You have to take his flesh and blood, his teaching, and, and the benefits of his death on the cross. You have to take that in in the way that he says. Confess your faith in him. Repent and be baptized in his name. Then you will receive the benefits of his death on the cross that was imminent. And, and so then, uh, eventually, Jesus changes locations, and um, these people follow him, and um, they say that they're there, you know, for good and noble reasons. Jesus says that, uh, no, you're, you're here uh, because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And uh, I want you to notice, you know, after this hard teaching of Jesus saying, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and, you, and after this hard teaching of saying, you know, you're not here for the right reasons, I want you to notice over in verse 66 of John 6, it says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The signs, the miracles, the teaching had done its work with Peter and the apostles even if uh, some of the other disciples were lacking. But some of them left then. They never walked with him again because of these difficult sayings. Jesus said, you're not here because the sign had its real uh, meaningful, true effect. You're, you're just here because the sign happened to be bread and you got your stomach full. If, we're, if, if we go to Jesus for the wrong reason, we're going to be easily taken away from Jesus. I, I preached in, from 1992 to 1995 in Harlan County, Kentucky, and one of the elders under which I worked at that time, uh, he had a saying that he used uh, on more than one occasion. And uh, in talking about the gimmicks that churches sometimes use, he says, well, I'll tell you what, if you bring them in with a hot dog, the church down the street will take them away with pizza. And he was exactly right. I mean, when you rely on gimmicks, and man, I've seen some gimmicks on posters posted around town and even on Facebook advertisements. Churches use gimmicks to get people in and to keep them. Well, to gimmicks, Jesus just flatly said no. Let's pray. Holy Father, we're thankful to you for this day, and we're thankful for your Son and for his signs and miracles. We pray that they will have the right effect on our hearts. Help us never to tempt the Lord and say, work a miracle. Do something so that I can believe in you. He's done so many things. Increase our faith. Help us to have true faith in you and in your Son. Father, there are many out there today who are looking for something to put their faith in. We ask that you'll direct them to your word and to your son and help, help us, use us in whatever way you see fit to bring people to you and to your son. Watch over us this day and help us to be good, good stewards of what you've given us and help us shine a light to a lost and dying world. Please forgive our sins and hear our prayer in Jesus' name, and amen. I tell you, one of the worst no's that Jesus will say and that will ever be heard uh, is mentioned in Matthew chapter 7 uh, and verses 21 through 23. Um, let, me just, let me just end with that. 
where it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Why do we have these devotions every day? To remind each other lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, that a day of judgment is coming, we don't want to hear the word no from Jesus on that day. Stay in your Bible. Stay in God's grace. God bless you to do that. Have a great day. Jesus, Lord God Light of the world, the Prince of Peace, hope of glory, man of song.